Although superhero films are not newcomers to cinema in the US, their number has certainly increased over the past decade. Although their ratio to the rest of the cinematography is far from that of the Western, for example, in its golden age, their popularity is more than obvious. What distinguishes the current superhero trend from the golden age of the Western is a new production and marketing strategy, especially from the most representative studio of the phenomenon, Marvel Studios. The fictional universe created by the studio has, as of today, 22 feature films diegetically interconnected. Due to its complexity, this shared universe can easily be studied from an angle similar to that of the TV series. These Marvel films, with their last film, have a total runtime of over 48 hours. Thanks to this process of seriality and interconnectivity, the studio has so far generated worldwide revenues of nearly $20 billion, and only in theatrical revenues, thus excluding sales and rentals and merchandise. Their latest release, Avengers Endgame, made $1.6 billion globally in just five days. So I wanted to know if and how the success of Marvel Studios' production and marketing methods, based on seriality and more specifically on the interval, depend on the waiting times of a growing fan network. Iron Man, released in 2008, marks the beginning of a major change in Marvel Studios' production methods. While the film appears as a conventional superhero film, enters a character hitherto absent from the film in a scene after the end credits. Nick Fury, director of S.H.I.E.L.D. Oh. I'm here to talk to you about the Avenger Initiative. This scene marks the first clue to what will become the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the MCU. The different film series are separated by their different protagonists, with exceptions, but beyond their own narrative line, each of these series is part of a greater world and a shared storyline in which all films are interconnected. Thus, in order to fully assimilate the story, viewing one series may require viewing one or more of the others. In parallel of these series separated by the protagonist, we find the Avengers series, which gathers the characters from the other films. In short, the MCU becomes an ever-expanding puzzle, in which each piece becomes more and more dependent on the others. As much as one would do for a TV series, Marvel Studios must think about the MCU series in terms of time, and maintain it in the long run. It must make use of the evolutionary possibilities of its serial state, while ensuring that it reasonably contains the diegetic universe and its narrative evolution, which may be irrelevant if the whole thing becomes too complex too quickly. However, the MCU's world-building becomes, over time, practically superfluous, since its parameters have already been established years before. With an ever-growing web, Marvel can then allow itself to advance the dramatic curves of certain characters already established in the big picture, and thus diminish the importance of several protagonists to the benefit of other characters. The screen time of the protagonist from Avengers Infinity War, released last year, is very revealing. The protagonists of the first phase of the MCU appear on screen a maximum of 17 minutes, and even as little as 7 minutes, over a duration of 2 hours and a half. The study of a phenomenon like Marvel's films can be compared to the study of television. Indeed, the concept of seriality must be at the heart of its epistemology. If the episode of the television series is taken as a unit in the modular nature of its whole, the MCU films are on two levels, the film inside the series of a protagonist and this series inside the MCU. The concept of seriality is a major one for Marvel. It is an important factor of their regular income. But what may present a risk to the company is the growing need for the possibilities contained in the intervals. These intervals between releases are increasingly short. First of all, the concept of flow of images is present, similar to what Netflix offers, for example. The inclusion of scenes during and after the end credits invites the viewer to stay on the lookout for the upcoming films. These post credit scenes showing clues to the next productions are at the end of every film so that any viewer can understand that the story continues in the near future. 
so it's easy to create anticipation without even increasing the cost of marketing. And if that wasn't enough, the studio started writing clearly that one character or another will return in a future production. With these methods, they try to convince us to remain hooked as a regular consumer of the series. At the same time, the internet has become a place for the creation and sharing of theories and speculations about the films. In her book Constellation, Anne Besson explains that the scale of appropriation is exploding with the democratization of the internet and high-speed streaming and is therefore within reach of a growing proportion of users, readers, audiences, players, not only simple tools to become creators themselves, but also a huge potential audience. Thanks to social networks, the interval allows the short and long-term development of a cultural forum. Fans discuss and stipulate the evolution and possibilities of the film series. With each new film, we see a growth in the dependence of the MCU on the extra diegetic dimension. The film is now a base for expansion. The knowledge of the fans thus becomes important, almost essential in the continuity of the series. Speculations and expectations, surprises, are essential in the evolution of the MCU. Some theories hold up with the flow of films, but with the acceleration of releases, most remain a world in themselves for a short time. Projects such as the MCUs have the potential for community creations outside of its diegetic world. Fans, in a sort of playful and social spirit, participate in the world proposed by Marvel. The introduction of a production system based on intervals is risky. A connected universe must take into account our equally connected society. Its marketing is now on the lookout for an already existing fan community in constant contact. But above all, it is becoming dependent on it. If the studio ceases to create these expectations within the intervals, admissions could potentially decrease. What the studio undertakes is to sow to his advantage what can lead to the creation of ephemeral virtual fictions, theories and speculations, which allows to establish a kind of semi-directed dialogue with the fans. Recently, the audience was in the gears of Captain Marvel. In a scene after the end credits of Avengers Infinity War, released on April 27, 2018, we invite the audience to the following events by briefly showing the logo of the character of Captain Marvel, until then absent from the MCU. On September 18, 2018, a first trailer for the film is released, showing the same logo. The film, Captain Marvel, is finally released on March 8, 2019. The next Thursday, on March 14, is released a trailer for the next film, Avengers Endgame, scheduled for release on April 26. The trailer confirms the presence of Captain Marvel in this new production. So we are told, just before the film starts its second weekend in theaters, that the character will have a certain importance in the next release the following month. With such a strategy, we first indicate at the end of Avengers Infinity War that Captain Marvel will be needed in the continuation of a greater story. We create expectations. Then we release the film, then confirm her presence in Avengers Endgame. Above all, Captain Marvel doesn't have time to be available for purchase or rental until her story, linked to that of the other characters, continues in theaters. This is how the studio convinces the audience to go see the present film in the theater as quickly as possible. This counters a decrease in the number of admissions to theaters by the second weekend. All this means a lot more money in the studio's pockets. Technically, could we go see the next Avengers without seeing Captain Marvel? Probably, but we would miss a piece of the puzzle, a potentially important part of the character's dramatic curve. Another risk is the ubiquity of social networks in everyday life, to find ourselves unwittingly in ephemeral fictionalization. The risk is that certain narrative elements will be spoiled by the connected fan community in the middle of a discussion. This brings me to the problematic situation of Spider-Man Far From Home, which second trailer started with an important message. The Spider-Man Far From Home trailer is about to play, but if you haven't seen Avengers Endgame yet, stop watching because there's some serious spoilers about to come up. But if you have seen Avengers Endgame, 
Enjoy the trailer. The world of the MCU has become so complex that it is now impossible to reveal the narrative basis of the next film without ruining the outcome of the last one. Even if they are not technically part of the same series. One problem then arises. The purpose of the MCU structure is to convince the audience to return to the theaters with every film. A film like Avengers Endgame attracted record crowds in its early days, but it may falter faster if too much information is revealed. Audiences who have not had the opportunity to see it during its first days or weeks in the cinema may be more inclined to wait for the Blu-ray release. They might also consider not going to see Spider-Man Far From Home either. Of course it's just a theory, but my point is that these methods certainly present a risk. Marvel Studios president and head of the MCU, Kevin Feige, announced that the Disney Plus streaming service, starting in November 2019, will have the exclusive rights to at least three new TV series, which stories will be linked to that of the MCU. These series will tell the stories of protagonists already known to the public through the films. There finally will be a major cross between Marvel's TV series and films. Marvel pushes its fans to use different media channels to ensure their complete knowledge of the shared universe, which inevitably results in additional regular revenue for the company, taking into account that the Disney Plus service will run on a subscription basis. By using the Hollywood blockbuster strategy, Marvel's productions become cultural event with every single release. What we are seeing here is what I would describe as a sort of mega blockbuster or time buster, meaning that films fill the theater space each time, but also this space in the time and duration that is constantly renewed and that is maintained in parallel in ephemeral virtual fictions. If the TV series can be considered as a space allowing infinite variations, the MCU draws its source elements from a bank of 8,000 characters, which allows an almost limitless durability for their cinematic adaptations. In my view, Marvel will inevitably move from series to cycle, or somewhere in between, to ensure the continuity of its success. The series is based on its heroes and the repetition of their performances, which alone justify the linking of its episodes while the cycle may offer a systematic renewal of its staff as part of the long story, or much more frequently, for a succession of generations preserving the continuity of the name. I think that some characters will be replaced by new iterations, but that the existence of the universe could go on for a long time.